2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. We're going to read from the NLV, I'm sorry, NLT, the New Living Translation. I'm going to just go back and touch a few points very quickly from what I did on Sunday. And I'm going to move forward with you for what I have for you tonight. And on verse 3, again from the New Living Translation, Paul is saying to Timothy, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For they, they cannot, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. It's very interesting to think about this. It's very interesting to think about what Paul is saying. Because if you really stop to think about it, it's almost as if, like, it's not connected. It doesn't make any sense. He's telling for us to endure, to, to be strong, to stand with him because soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of the civilian life. And then he says, if athletes don't follow the rules, they cannot win the prize. It's like two different things completely distinct. Soldiers and athletes. And he's saying if they don't follow the rules, they cannot win the prize. In order for you to be successful, you have to follow the rules. You have to follow the, what was already established as a program, whatever it is, in your job. If you don't follow the rules, you're out. If you're driving, if you don't follow the rules, a police officer is going to stop you. Amen? In the kingdom of God, it's not about the Ten Commandments. This is not the rules that I'm talking about. These are different rules that I'm talking about. I'm talking about following principles that were established by God. And what Paul is saying, and where I see the connection between the soldiers, the connection that I see between the soldiers and the athletes is right in the beginning of verse 3. Endure suffering along with me, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And do suffering. One thing that you can always know about soldiers and successful professional athletes is their ability to stay strong and follow orders and listen and hear instructions no matter what they're doing. Though that's very common about these two type of people. That's what I'm saying. It seems like they're very distinct, but they're not. Soldiers have to listen to orders. They have to be focused. They have to listen to the captain. They have to listen to the person who is in charge, the officer who is over them. And if you watch some movies even, you see sometimes that a, an experienced officer, captain, will tell a younger officer in, 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 a, in a battle zone, in a war zone, if you don't listen to me, you're going to die. If you listen to me, we're going to go back home. Have you ever seen things like that? And you, sometimes you get, you get some young blood that they just want to run. And I remember a long time ago, my wife loved this movie, but this Brazilian movie that was called uh, Tropa de Elite, Elite Troops. If you translate it to English, it was an amazing, amazing, incredible movie. And it talks about this, this captain and... For a moment in one of the movies, because I think it was one or two, was two or three. I think it was two, two movies, right? Two movies. And I don't remember exactly if it was in the first one or in the second one, but I believe it was the first one. He, he wants to get out of the, of the front line. He wants to be in the back. And he is looking for new young bloods that are training that can take his position. And then he says to his wife, I found the guy. I found him. He, he got, he's just like me when I was young. I got him. He's gonna, he's, he's, he has the same attitude, the same hunger. His stuff, he will not compromise. He will not get corrupted. This is the guy. This is the guy. He's training him, and he's all excited because after 
he qualifies this guy, and he's ready to take up his position, he was going to retire. His wife was pregnant, so he was all excited. His wife was all excited. And then one day, part of their training was to go into a war zone. Was to go into a war zone and, and literally had to deal with, with shootings for, against enemies coming from everywhere. And he's telling this guy, stay here with me, follow the orders, go here, go there. Let's hide here for a moment. Let's keep going. And then all of a sudden, this kid got so excited and so hungry that he didn't really think and start crossing in the middle of the of 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 shot uh, of gunshots coming from everywhere, and he risking himself, risking his life, risking everybody else's life because he was too overwhelmed that he couldn't even listen. He just thought, "I got this. I'm gonna do this." And then he had to come and rescue the kid. And then when he brought him back, he, he said, you're not ready. You're not ready. He said, you don't deserve this badge. You don't deserve to be in this military because you're not ready. You cannot listen to instructions. You almost killed yourself and everybody else in this team. So that's what Paul is saying. You cannot be distracted with civilian life. And you cannot also get overwhelmed with your own thoughts that you cannot listen to instructions. If in the kingdom of God, we, are not, we're, we don't have the ability to listen to God and God's word and God's instruction over our lives, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. We're going to get ourselves in trouble. Two things that we need to have. We need to have the ability to hear, follow instructions, and we need to have the ability to endure. Soldiers endure. They stay in the cold. They stay in the wet. They stay hungry if necessary. They go without sleep for days, but they don't lose focus of the mission. You cannot take your eyes off of the prize. You cannot take your eyes off of the vision. You cannot take your eyes off of the assignment. You have to stay committed. Whatever that is in your life, whatever dream you have, the call of God, the promises of God for your life, you have to stay focused to the, assign, to the assignment and not get tied up with civilian life. And I said it on Sunday, I'm going to say it again. Civilian life is walking by the flesh. Is walking by the senses. Is checking how the economy is. Is checking how the, the weather is. Is checking how your bank account is before everything you do. Before you make decisions. Before you believe God. You check everything else in your surrounding first to see if it will make sense. To see if it's going to work. You're in, uh, this is what I like to say. You're in your carnal natural mind. And you cannot be in your carnal natural mind if you want to live the promises of God. Your dreams, even your personal dreams, outside, you, inside of your carnal natural mind, you're going to be limited. You're going to work your behind off. You may even succeed one day, but if you do it in the spiritual way, if you do it with God, you're going to do better. God is going to do better for you. God is going to do something greater for you. And guess what? It's going to be easier and faster. God's way is always better. Let me show you how God's way is always better. God's way for the Israelites was to go from Egypt to the promised land in 11 days. Their way took 40 years. Their way, their carnal mind took 40 years and only two got in. Three million died while going there in a journey. If they obeyed God, if they followed God, if they did everything that God said for them to do, they would make it in 11 days. But when you're doing, you can't listen to instructions, you can't follow instructions, then you get yourself in trouble. Athletes, you have to. You're, you're, you're not playing tennis. You know what I mean? Tennis is just one player. <laughs> but even a tennis player has to have the ability to listen to his coach. Nobody's alone on anything. And you have to have endurance like an athlete. You have to have focus like an athlete. And if you don't play by the rules, you're disqualified. If you don't play by the rules, you are disqualified. So what is the rule of faith? The rule of faith is that you have to believe, you have to, I'm sorry, you have to act on what you're believing. 
That's the rule of faith. If you don't play by the rules of faith, you're disqualified. That's why there are a lot of Christians today in the body of Christ that are extremely frustrated. That's why there are people that said, I already tried this faith thing because you didn't play by the rules. It's not that it doesn't work. It won't work if you don't do it right. That's why it's extremely important that people get into the word. That's why you need to submit yourself and people need to submit themselves to a faith church. A church that preaches faith because faith is the key element for victory in this world. Is the key element for victory in this life. You cannot have victory outside of faith. The Bible says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So you cannot live your life faithless and expect to have victory. It just doesn't work that way. Just doesn't work that way. You cannot get saved without with you cannot get saved without faith. Just grace alone doesn't work. Grace is the fruit. Faith is the hand. You can put a tree right here full of fruits and you say, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Yeah, just saying that you're hungry and that there is a tree available with great, with great delicious fruits just in front of you is not going to feed your belly. How you, what do you need to do to, get, to feed your belly? Get up and grab it and eat it. So listen to me. Do you believe that if you eat something, if you eat a fruit, you're hungry. If you eat a fruit, you're going you're gonna to satisfy your hunger? Do you believe that? Um, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a trick. It's not a tricky joke. Do you believe that? That if you're hungry, and if there's a fruit in front of you, there's a tree with fruit in front of you, you're going to eat it, you're going to satisfy your hunger? Do you believe that? I believe that. Right? But it's not going to feed me. Just because I'm looking at it. I'm not going to get satisfied just because, wow, it's here. God gave it to me by grace. I didn't plant this. I didn't earn this. God gave it to me. Awesome. He did. But if you want to really satisfy yourself, get up and go get it. Do you believe, watch this. Do you believe that that fruit, that apple tree can satisfy you? Yes. So what do you need to do now? You need to act on your belief. You need to act on your belief. What's to act on your belief? Go get it. Go eat it. Do you believe that God can prosper you? Yes. Go get a job. Some people, they want to God, God will prosper me. Yeah, get a job. Do something. Think or start a business. Do something. But Get busy, occupied. Are you with me, somebody? So that's why we need to be in a faith place, in a faith environment, because we need to learn by the Word of God about the rules of faith, how to succeed, how to overcome. And I like what Bishop Oyedepo said. If you believe you have gotten a job, get up early and be ready as one who's going to work. If you believe you're more than a conqueror, then carry the bright look of an overcomer on your face. Don't look like this and say, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, amen, hallelujah. How you doing, brother? Yeah, just hanging in there. That's not an overcomer statement. I remember calling some people one time, you know, this got under my skin. I called... Long time ago, I call I call a, a a guy from our church, and then I, hey brother, how are you? You know, just hanging in there, not too bad. Is that a faith statement? Hanging in there, not too bad. Not too bad. And you call yourself a faith man, and you call yourself a faith person, and that's what comes out of your mouth. Not too bad. Not, you know, some people even say, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm breathing, right? Yeah, you have what you say. You have what you say. You, you're you're going to have according to your faith, according to your expectation, according to your, according to your, to your belief. You can believe something and act different. You're breaking the law. 
You're breaking the law. To believe one thing and act differently is contrary to the law of faith. It's contrary to the law of faith. So you have to play by the rules. And I want you to get this. And the reason why you need to play by the rules and the rules of faith is that the rule of faith will always, and I mean it, always challenge you to put down your preconceived notion. One thing that the rule of faith, one thing that faith is going to do to you, that's a, it's a number one. I'm, I'm not going to say the number one because the number one is acting on what you're believing. But I'm not, there's no order. But I want to say that it's one of the most important keys, one of the most important rules in the rule of faith is that you, you have to get out of your natural mind and your preconceived notions. Your preconceived notions is, is what you think God is going to do. I think it's going to happen this way. I think. The only thing that I know, that I know that I say, I, it's not that I think, it's that I know, is that God is going to do something. How he's going to do it, I don't know. And the problem is that a lot of people, they create this whole story, this whole thing on how it's going to happen on how they're going to be healed. If they go, if they go to a meeting of this super anointed minister, they think they preconceived notions. They're gonna, I'm gonna go there. He's gonna lay hands on me. That is not faith. I'm not saying that you should not be going to meetings that there are men anointed men. There are, but there are people that the, the, their faith is not in God for the healing. Is in the men. And it's not in the word. They have the preconceived notion that if they go to the meeting of so and so, they're going to get healed. If they go to this, if they get this job, they're going to be happy. If they get married, they're going to be happy. They have this idea, they, these preconceived notions of how things are going to change in their lives, and they're finally going to get happy. You, one of the things that you have to get out of it is your natural mind. And stop having preconceived notions on how God is going to bless you. I don't know how he's going to bless me, how he's going to grow the church, how he's going to increase me, how he's going to prosper me. But I know that he will. When, when Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, he said, I'm, we're not going to bow. Our God is able. He didn't say that. He didn't say, he didn't, they didn't know how God was going to deliver them. They only knew that God was going to deliver them. They had no idea that God was going to show up inside of the fiery furnace and get them out without a smell of smoke. They didn't know that. All they knew is that we're not going to compromise and God is going to deliver us. That's all they knew. You don't need to know the house. You need to know the end result. And the end result is you and I standing in faith, celebrating our victory because our God is faithful. Say this with me. My God is faithful. He wants to bless me. Say it out loud. He wants to bless me. And he will. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants to bless me and he will. So you got to get out of your... Your, your preconceived notions. Because faith does not ask you your opinion. Faith requires your obedience. Faith does not ask your opinion. Do you think this is possible? Do you think I can do this? Do you think it's logical? Faith does not ask your opinion. Faith requires your obedience. And faith will always challenge you to live from your spirit rather than your mind. Live from your spirit. Like I said a few minutes before, if you live from your spirit, if you listen to the instruction, if you listen to God, and you live from the spirit and not from your mind, it's going to be faster and easier. Rather than doing it from your mind. Just like the Israelites and delay their blessing and delay the provision and delay the miracle and delay the rest. Imagine that they would never have to work again. That whole generation, they wouldn't have to work. 
They were going to a land that had everything ready for them in incredible abundance. Remember, Numbers 13, when the 10 spies, the 12 spies came back, they brought grapes, a cluster of grape that was so big that two men need to carry. That's just an example. A land that flowed with milk and honey. They wouldn't have to harvest. They wouldn't have to work. They would live in the goodness of God. Are you with me? So we saw yesterday, not yesterday, Sunday, I gave you very quickly that story of Jesus in Matthew chapter 17, that Jesus went to Peter and said, Peter, I want you to go down fishing. And the first fish that you catch is going to have a silver coin in its mouth, and I want you to get it and pay taxes for both of us. And I told you that Jesus could have used any other disciple for that. Jesus could call Matthew, which is a tax collector, and Matthew wouldn't probably question Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us that Peter questioned Jesus, but knowing Peter, according to the scripture, he questioned on the inside. He said, really, Jesus? Really, Jesus? Jesus, do you know what I, what I did for a living? I was a fisherman. And now one day in my life, I went fishing and got fish with coin, with money in its mouth. But you see, Jesus wanted to challenge him. Jesus had the money to pay for taxes. They had a treasurer. They had enough money. But Jesus was dealing with Peter to get out of his natural mind and start living from the Spirit. Get out of your preconceived notions. Get out of your natural ideas. Jesus could have asked anybody else, but he asked a fisherman. You know why? Because he wanted Peter to see that living from the Spirit was greater than than the experience he had in the natural. When God gives you a word, that's what he wanted Peter to get and you to get tonight and me to get tonight, that when God gives us a word, we have to get out of what we think is right. We have to stop thinking of what we think, the logic, your experience. Well, I've done this before. It doesn't matter. I don't care how much time of experience, how many years of experience we have. Our ideas, our opinions, when it comes to God's word, does not matter. We have to obey. We have to endure. We have to listen. We have to stay focused to the assignment and not get ourselves caught up and tied up with civilian things, civilian lives. Listen to God. That's playing by the rules. That's playing by the rules. He said, it doesn't matter. Peter, you don't have to put the fish, the money in the mouth, in the fish's mouth. All you have to do is go get the fish. Now I have a question for you. Did the fish find the money at the bottom of the lake? Did somebody just throw from a boat and the fish went by and ate it and carried it in his mouth because he couldn't swallow it? Did Jesus make the coin appear inside of the first fish he caught? It's not that the first fish had a coin in it, but Jesus put it in there miraculously. Which are the, the ways that you want to you you have a preconceived idea of the miracle? Because by trying to figure it out which way he did it, is having a preconceived idea. You know, what the, you know what the answer is? It doesn't matter because he can do all of it. He can do all of it. He can make somebody throw the coin. He can make the, 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 the fish go under the lake and find the coin. He can make a coin show up inside of the fish's mouth. Jesus can do all of it. So it doesn't matter how it gets done. It doesn't matter how it's going to happen. What it matters, it's happening if you don't have the ability to listen. If Peter said, I'm not doing this, call somebody else, he would have missed the miracle. 
It doesn't matter how it's going to happen. All I know is it's going to happen because my Jesus said so. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen because my Jesus said so. Because my God said so. So I'm going to believe. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm focused. I'm focused on the prize. I'm focused on the goal. I'm focused on what's ahead. Let me show you something. Come on, somebody. I told you I'm going to flow with you. Open with me in the Hebrews. Let me show you something. You have to stay focused. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you something powerful. This is, it came just from the Spirit of God. Twice the Holy Spirit put this in my spirit as I'm speaking here to you. Verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by the such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let me pause here one second. Let us throw away anything that holds us back. You see, a soldier, an athlete, cannot be focused on things that are distraction. Anything that it's a distraction, you have to get it out, get it, get it out of your life. Anything. If it's a TV, if it's social media... If it's a relationship, whatever it is, even if it's your job that is consuming your faith, believe God for something else. But you have to get, get, a, get it out of your life, whatever is holding you back. This is what he's saying. Since we're surrounded by a such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Get, her, get rid of sin. Whatever is dealing, whatever is keeping you down, stop it. What is it, Pastor? You know. The Holy Spirit's in you. He's telling you. I don't need to tell you which one it is. I don't live with you. I'm not in your mind. I'm not in people's mind. I don't tell them, do this, don't do that. Listen to the Spirit. Amen? And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us let us run with perseverance the race stay focused on your race and he, listen to me that race is not a race that you're competing with your with somebody else you're not competing with another ministry with another minister with another co-worker you're not competing with your family member you're competing with yourself i want to be better every day i want to be a better version of myself tomorrow I want to be a better pastor on Sunday than I am tonight. I want to be a better. That's the race that I need to stay focused on. That's the race. I'm not focused on the people that are, 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 are cheering for me. I'm not focused on the people that are booing me. I'm focused on the prize. What is the prize? The finish line. You don't get a medal for participating. You get a medal, a medal for finishing. Talk to me, somebody. Come on, I'm preaching good tonight. You don't get a medal for participating. This is not a five-year-old league. This is not the minor league. Let's give everybody a trophy so they can feel good. No, 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 no. Give the trophy to the winners. That's how I grew up. You know, I had a hard time when Jordan was little that I would bring Jordan to some games. And if Jordan's team was winning good, and they're like beating the kids, five, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, five, zero, six, zero, after six, the coaches will tell the kids, don't score anymore, because you're humiliating the other kids. You're going to make them feel bad. And I'm on the other side, go, keep going. Now it's better to do it, because they're vulnerable. Kick their behind. Crush them. Oh, they're little kids. No, they're not little. You have to teach them that losing is horrible, that you want to be a winner. Yeah, you have to teach them that it's not fun to lose. Now that you know, we got to teach them, you know, to compete and be. No, no, we can teach them to win. And sometimes you don't win, you feel bad, you get better, and you win the next game. But you win. When I grew up, when I played soccer in Brazil, we didn't have that. If we won by 100, we would celebrate and post it everywhere. My God, nobody ever did what we did. Doesn't matter how many goals. 
I want to win. That's what it means to win, to stay focused and run your race. Watch this now. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That's why we don't get distracted. We keep looking to the prize. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Because he is the author. He's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy, this is where I want to get with you. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Keep on standing. Keep on enduring. Stay focused. Keep your eyes on Jesus because that's what he did when he was going through the cross, the Bible says. And you know what made Jesus stay strong? Watch this now. He was looking ahead. Watch it. Watch this. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was looking at what was going to happen after he said, it is finished. That you and I will be free. That the devil could never, could never keep anybody slave anymore. As a slave anymore. That the devil could never put sickness on you. That Jesus could not heal you. Come on somebody. He was looking at the prize. The family. The souls that would be saved. For the joy set before him. He said after I go through this. I'm going to be promoted to sit at the right hand of my father. That was his promotion. Is going back to heaven and having all of us saved. He even said that those that my father gave in the book of John, that my father gave me, nobody can pluck them out of my hands. That's why. He said, I'm going to endure it because after I go through it, nobody's going to take them off. Nobody's going to take them away. Nobody's going to destroy them. Everyone who are mine that God gave me, they're mine. And the devil is not going to steal their destiny. Come on, somebody, talk to me. Are you understanding this? So that's how we need to do. We need to stay focused on the prize. What is the promise? What is the goal? What is the dream? What is the word that God has given us? That's where you have to have your eyes, not in the circumstances, not in the journey, not in what you're going through right now. What you're going through is not your final destination. You're just going through it. Even though if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because my God is with me. I, I'm walking through it. I'm not staying in the shadow. I'm not staying in the valley of shadow of death. I'm walking through it. My God is with me. The final destination is this. Surely mercy and goodness will follow me all the days of my life that's how it ends it doesn't end with the psalmist dying in the valley come on somebody it doesn't end with suffering it ends with you in victory it ends with you celebrating are you with me somebody So get this. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. Verse 1 tells us, story, tells us a story of a powerful man called Naaman. He was the commander of the army. Naaman was the commander of the army 
of Aaron. And he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, Lord, the Lord had given victory to the people of Aaron. And he was a valiant or a valiant or a strong or a mighty soldier. But there's one problem with Naaman. Naaman had leprosy. If you go through this story, I'm not going to read everything for, for sake of time. But one day, there was a girl working at his house, a servant that worked at his house, and she was from Israel. And she said, if he would only go to see the prophet, he will be healed. If he would only go to see the prophet that we have in Israel, surely he would be healed. And it's funny because today, in this modern day, we have people that say, well, I don't need to go to church because for a miracle, if God wants to heal me, he knows where I live. If God wants to bless me, he knows where I live. I can worship God from my living room. You're not doing it. Stop lying to yourself. I can't read the word in my house. Yes, you can, but you're not doing it. Because, let me tell you something, the reason why I know, okay, I can tell you that people are not doing it. You know why? Because the Bible teaches us very, very well about the importance of being in church. So everybody that says that they're, 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 they're doing the word, because they're not in church, but they're preaching. They're, doing, they're not doing it. Because if you're living by the word, the word will tell you, go to church. The word, even, the Bible even says very clearly, in times like this, in end times, make sure you don't forsake the gathering. Like many people are doing, don't be one of them. So people that says, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to church, but I pray for people. I do that. Stop lying. Just stop lying. Because you're not doing it. You know, God can just heal me. Yes, he can. But you don't have faith for him to heal you there, so it's not going to happen. You need to be in a place where your faith is trashed. You need to be a place where God is challenging you to believe, where there is an anointing for healing, where there's an anointing for prosperity. You want to be prosperous, be in a place where there's an anointing for prosperity. You want to be delivered, be in a place where there's an anointing for deliverance, where people do believe in being, de in being, and people being set free and delivered from any junk. You have to be in that environment. And people say that all the time. And it's amazing that she said, if he goes to see the prophet, I know he'll be healed. She didn't say, you know, there's a prophet there. Just believe you can probably be healed here. No, if you go see him, if you go where the anointing is, if you go where the anointing is, it's a different story. And then he went to see Elisha. And this is a big picture of being, of having preconceived notions. He went to see Elisha. And Elisha said to the servant, go to the door and tell him to just go and wash himself seven times in the Jordan River. He got so angry. He got so mad. The Bible tells us that he said, I thought that he would come out and lay his hands on me and declare that I will be healed and I will be healed. He had a whole idea in his mind how his miracle was going to take place. He thought that the prophet was going to come and lay a red carpet for him because he was a powerful man and honored and, make a, and kill a cow. Let's do a barbecue. 
and just do this and let's do a big party. No, a powerful man came to see the prophet. No. He said, let him come to me. That's what Elisha said. Let him come. He will see that there is a man of God in Israel. That's what he said. Let him come to me. And then we came. He was expecting the men to come and lay hands on him. He said, no, the servant, tell, go him. Tell him at the door. Just go to the door. I don't even need to talk to him. Just let him know if he goes to the Jordan River and bathe himself seven times, he will be healed. He got so angry, he left there and said, there are better rivers where we live. I don't need to do this. This is ridiculous. This is an embarrassment for a man like me. But you see, sometimes God wants to tell you simple things. And sometimes when we hear simple things, we miss on God because it's too simple. It doesn't sound like God. Because we have a preconceived notion that it's going to be difficult. We have a preconceived notion that it's going to be hard. It's going to require something really challenging. And then it's going to stretch my faith, and then God is going to operate. That's not how it works. You have to get out of your natural mind and live from the Spirit. Just do what He tells you to do. That's what Jesus' mother said to the servants. Just do what He tells you to do. And He said, go, and He was about to refuse it. He said, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And then another servant says, but my master... If he asked you to do something difficult, you would have said yes. He's asking you to do something simple. You see, we expect the difficulty. We expect the challenge. We expect something different because we have what? Preconceived ideas. We have preconceived notions and we are in our natural mind trying to figure it out the miracle and the miracle is going to come when we start living from the spirit and not from our minds. And you know why God was telling him to do something where he thought was embarrassing? Because God sometimes wants to deal with our pride. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. God, we, God wants us to, to just to submit ourselves to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you want me to give, I'll give. Whatever, wherever you want me to serve, I'll serve. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I am your servant. I am your son, but I love you and I serve you as a servant. Whatever you say, Lord, I will do it. That's what we need to do. That is a secret for our victories, our ability to endure, and it's our ability to hear. In order to live the supernatural, you have to be willing to look ridiculous sometimes. You have to be willing to look ridiculous sometimes. I don't care what people are going to say. I don't care what people are going to think. I want my miracle. I'm focused. Keep your eyes on Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the, set, for the joy set before you, you endure your challenges. Discouragement. Backstabbing. Betrayals. Abandonment. Rejection. What is it that you're dealing with? Financial problems. What is that you're dealing with? Keep your eyes on Jesus for the joy set before you. Let me, let me close by saying this. You need to get out of your carnal mind and get into the spirit, into your spiritual mind in order to accelerate your miracle. I wrote this at 6 a.m. this morning. I was sitting in my living room and I was listening to a powerful faith man. And he was not even preaching on this. But I was meditating on this and praying. And God said this to me. Tell my people. In order for you to live the supernatural, you're going to have to get out of your carnal mind and get into the spiritual mind 
to accelerate your miracle. And then he said more. Think how long it would have taken for Peter to work and earn the money to pay taxes. How long it would have taken for Naaman to be healed from leprosy by visiting the doctors? Come on, somebody, talk to me. In order for you to accelerate the miracle, you got to get out of your natural mind. You got to live from the spirit. That is the, that is the rule. And if you don't play by it, Naaman said, we have much better rivers by us. I'm not going to wash myself in this dirty river. You can't do that. You got to get out of your mind. Sometimes what God is going to ask you to do is so simple. And that's why sometimes we have a hard time believing him. Sometimes what God is requiring from us, it's so simple that we're having a hard time believing that it's God. When God gives you, gives you a word, just do what he told you to do. People come to church, I want a word from God. People watch people on Facebook, I want a word from God. People watch prophets, social media prophets. That they have God, is, they have a word for thousands of people saying, God is going to raise you. It's almost like I'm going to a, a crowd of 10,000 people say, God is healing somebody today. Oh, yeah. 10,000 people here, somebody's sick. That's easy. God wants to bless you. Yeah, 10,000 people. Yeah. So sometimes people are looking for a word from God. Lord, give me a word. Lord, give me a word. And God has said, you didn't do the last one I gave you. You're asking for a new direction. Give me a word, Lord. Give me instruction. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, Lord. I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. Just tell me. He said, let's, okay, so let's go back and do the last thing I told you to do. What is that he asked you to do? Just do what he told you to do. Amen? Did you get this tonight? Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise.